It's so good to see everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're so excited to be able to gather together as God's people. Uh, anytime that we can get together as God's people is a good day. Uh, but today we have four individuals that are ready to be baptized, and we're super excited for them. Uh, we're also going to be baptizing next Sunday. You'll hear me more, say more about that later. Uh, wonderful thing. God's at work in the life of our church. Uh, after we baptize next Sunday, we'll have baptized 25 people uh, so far this year. Yeah, you can applaud for that. So we're super excited. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit before we do baptism, uh, what baptism really is and what it's not. So first of all, let me tell you that there is nothing magical about the water that we have here today. Uh, it is just good old Curry County water. Um, it cannot wash away your sins. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. And so the reason that we get baptized is not to be saved. It's because we are saved. It's our public profession of faith. And so each person that's going to come here today has already received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they're ready to publicly profess that by baptism. And baptism tells a story of what Jesus has done for them. Uh, when we lay them under the water, it's uh, them dying to their old life and Jesus washing them clean. And we raise them up out of the water. We're raising them up to the newness of life that only Jesus can give. And so we're excited for that. Don't want to uh, wait anymore. So let's have them come down. Michael, why don't you come down first? This is Michael Booth. Hello, my name is Michael. I have accepted Jesus into my heart and I'm ready to be baptized. All God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Michael. We thank you for bringing him to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And Father, that he's here today, not ashamed to publicly profess his faith in you. And God, I pray from this day forward that you would continue to grow him into the man that you've created him to be, to use him mightily for your kingdom. And so, Father, we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. And, and we pray as a church that we would love him, support him, and encourage him in his walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Michael, it is my privilege to baptize you as my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Well, we're super excited. I have an opportunity to baptize a mom and her two daughters today. And so Shelby, why don't you come on? This is Shelby Mitchell. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shelby Mitchell. I have accepted Jesus into my heart and I'm ready to be baptized and I'm ready to watch my girls get baptized. All God's people said, <laughs> let's pray. Father, we thank you for Shelby. We thank you for this moment in her life as she's not ashamed of who you are and what you've done. And God, I just pray that you would continue to grow her and transform her into the woman you've created her to be and use her mightily in your kingdom. And God, may we as a church love her, support her, and encourage her as she continues on her walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Shelby, it is my privilege to baptize you as my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. All right. Millie. Accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm ready to be baptized. All God's people said, <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Millie. We thank you for uh, her being here today to publicly profess her faith in you. Father, I pray that you would continue to grow her into the godly young woman that you've created her to be. Help us to love her, support her, and encourage her as she continues on that walk. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Stay right there. Okay. Millie, it's my privilege to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. All right. Last but not least, Addie. All 
Right. This is Addie, and she's asked Jesus to be her Lord and Savior, and she's ready to be baptized today. All God's people said, amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Addie. We thank you for bringing her to this moment. And I, God, I pray that you would continue from this moment forward to help her to grow into the young woman that you've created her to be. God, help us as a church to love her, support her, and encourage her in her walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. All right, you ready? Put your finger in your nose. Right there. Addie, it's my privilege to baptize you as my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. worshiping our one true God and our King, but there is something very special about the Sunday BBS starts, and so in case you couldn't tell by all the colorful decorations today, we are starting BBS uh, this Monday, tomorrow, and so today we get just to feature some of the songs that we're going to be uh, singing uh, this week. And so if you, I know you know you don't know some of these songs, but just worship uh, as the Spirit is leading you. And will you please stand on your feet? and our works on decorating. We have Chris and Kaylee and the team that were lights here on the stage. And of course we have Katie and Fong here with the dancers and working on that very hard. We have Dawn and all the decorators. Would you give them all a round of applause for their work? Very grateful for everything that they have done thus far. So welcome. We are glad that you all are here to worship with us this morning. If you are a guest or a first-time visitor, we hope that you feel welcomed as you came in. Hopefully as you came in, you received a church bulletin. And in that church bulletin, I don't have one in hand, I usually do, but you're going to find different things, activities that are here in the life of our church. We do pray that you would take a look through those things pray and discern how God would have you connect here at Central. Once again, if this is your first time visiting here with us, 
there is a connection card in that bulletin. If you just take a couple of moments to fill out your information, we'd love to connect with you. And once again, just express how glad we are that you are here. Well, at this time, if you would stand, we're gonna greet those around us. jumping and dancing, but they have a lot of energy.
Okay, this next song has a lot of movements, but I think it will be easy to follow. If you try, you may need some room. you guys. Let's pray before Michael comes up. Thank you, Lord, for life, for the gift of life, for BBS, and most importantly, for the good news that Jesus loves us and that he is our friend, Lord. And I just pray for our hearts to be tuned to you and let everything we do glorify you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. If you got your copy of scripture, if you'll turn to the book of Romans, <clears throat> Romans chapter three, you know, they changed the VBS music a lot from when I was a kid. They've added a lot of calisthenics into it. Uh, you know, that last song I was thinking if I went down, 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 I'm wondering who's going to get me up, up, up. Um, but that's a little snippet of what you're going to see at VBS. And we love Vacation Bible School because it's an opportunity for us to be able to share the gospel. That we get to spend a week with boys and girls, talking to them and telling them that God loves them. And so every year before we start VBS, I like to share the gospel. Um, you know, most of you are not gonna get to come and participate in VBS. And so I want you to hear that God loves you too. Now, we all love stories, right? We love compelling stories that have kind of gut-wrenching things that happen or, or heart-pounding action. Or we, we, we love these stories that draw us in. And I wanna share a story with you today that is the most compelling story of all. It's the story of how God saves you and how God saves me. Now, as we kind of begin the story, one of the things that we have to think about is why do we need to be saved? What do we need to be saved from? And so as we start to look at the story of God's salvation, we have to start off with some bad news. 
And so the first question that I think we need to ask as we look at this is what does it mean to be lost? That's a church word. We throw that word around a lot. We say that people who don't know Jesus are lost. People who live in sin are lost. What does that mean? What does it mean to be lost? And, and then also a question that comes along with that is, what do we need to be saved from? Another church word, right? We ask people, are you saved? Have you been saved? You heard four people say, I've been saved by Jesus. What are we saved from? That's a pretty loaded word, right? That if we need to be saved or rescued, that there must be this problem. So what does it mean? Well, in Romans 3.23, we are given a definition about every person. And in Romans 3.23, this is what it says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, that's a pretty broad statement and very powerful statement that every person who has ever lived, who is living now, and whoever will live in the future are gonna be sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when we talk about the word sin, we need to define what it means. A very simple definition of sin is this. Sin is anything that we do that God has told us not to do. And sin is anything that we don't do that God has told us to do. Very simple. All of us are sinners. In fact, more than just being sinners, we are infected with sin. We are infected with sin and we are infected with death. I want you to look in Romans chapter five and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. What does it mean to be lost? It means that you are infected with a terminal disease called sin. And that terminal disease called sin has a byproduct called death. And all of us have it. 100% of humanity are born in sin and born with death. It's a disease. Because our mother and father, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God and sinned against God. They opened the door to sin and death came to them. And every person that came from their line, death spread to them and sin spread to them. So here's what it means to be lost. One thing, you are infected with an eternal terminal disease. Now, what happens a lot of times when we talk about sin, we say silly things like this. Well, if I do bad things, maybe I can do good things to offset the bad things that I do. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Can you do good works to stave off an infection? Can you do good works and stop cancer from growing in your body? It's ridiculous, right? You have to have an antidote to the sickness that you have and good works isn't it. And so here's the reality. There's no amount of good works that you can do to stave off the infection that you have called sin and death. What does it mean to be lost? Well, what does Romans 3.23 say? We all fall short. We're all sinners. We all sin and we all fall short of God's standard. There's a, another thing that happens when we talk about sin. People will say stuff like this. Well, I'm a good person. We start throwing around these morally loaded, loaded words and, and you have to stop and say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by good? Well, here's what we mean. We mean that we found somebody in the world that we think that we're better than. And so when we say we're good, what we mean is compared to this person. Compared to this person, I'm good. Now, here's the problem with our comparison. We always find people that are, you know, just exponentially worse than us, right? We'll say, I'm a good person. I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. Good for you. That's a low standard, right? But here's the problem. When someone says I'm a good person, you have to ask them compared to who? Compared to what? 
See, the, the standard that God has set for us to enter into heaven as a person without his grace and mercy is Jesus. It's perfection. And here's what it tells us. All of us fall short of perfection. I love when I'm sharing the gospel with kids and we get to this point and I ask them, what does it mean to be perfect? And they know the answer. It means to never do anything ever, ever wrong, ever, ever. And the follow-up question hits them hard. Are you perfect? And their eyes get wide. No. Well, then you can't go to heaven. See, here's the thing that we don't want to see or understand. What does it mean to be lost? It means that you've fallen short of God's standard, which is Jesus. God does not compare you to any other human being. God doesn't compare you to me. He doesn't compare me to you. When he says that you've fallen short, who he compares you to is Jesus. Jesus is the standard. And when Jesus is the standard, we all fall short. And none of us are good. What does it mean to be lost? Well, it means that we are infected. It means that we're not perfect, but also it means that there's an active part of our lifestyle that is messed up. Romans 6, 23, I want you to look at that. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. What does it mean to be lost? It means that you are living a life that you're earning something. We, we like to pretend that we're neutral. We like to pretend that all the stuff that we do is neutral, but here's what the Bible tells us. We are affected by sin. We are not perfect. We don't live in perfect, perfect harmony with God and we don't follow his standards perfectly and completely. But here's what happens. Even more than that, the way in which we live our life, we are earning something. All of us who work, when we come to the end of the week, we expect to be paid. Why? because we earned it. The problem is, is that what we don't, what we wanna have happen in our paycheck, we don't wanna have happen in our relationship with God. We are living in such a way that we are earning something with our life. And if we come to the end of the life and something radically hasn't changed, when we get our payment for that life, we say, no, thank you. You know what that payment is? The wages of sin, is death. Not physical death. If that was all it was, it wouldn't be that bad. No, this is physical death plus something else. It's called spiritual death. The wages of sin is death. And here's what that death is. Death is eternal separation from God. When we live our life apart from him and we live our life on our own and we do our own thing in our own way for our own self, we are storing up for ourselves death. And one day when we die, if we've never received Jesus and our, our lost condition has never been changed, we receive the wages, the payment, the consequence of our life, and that is separation from God. Now, I wanna say something really difficult that's gonna be hard to hear. But people say things like this. Why did God send that person to hell? And I need you to hear me say this. God has never sent anyone to hell. If someone goes to hell, they have chosen it by the way that they've lived their life. That's the reality. God does not force you to go to hell. God does not make you go to hell. God offers you a gift of salvation and you choose not to accept it. God does not send anyone to hell. See, the, the reality that we don't want to own is that we are responsible for our life. And God has given us free will and God has given us a choice and he's given us a choice to choose life or to choose death. And ultimately what's happening is this. 
We either say to God in this life, God, your will be done. I will surrender to you. I will follow you. I will worship you. Your will be done. Or God says to us in the next life, your will be done. God will not force us to be in his presence. God will not force us to follow his will, but God will respect our choice. So what does it mean to be lost? It means that we are actively choosing death for our life. Now that's the bad news. People don't like when we share the bad news, but we have to share the bad news because when we share the bad news, the good news is really good news. So let me share some good news with you. What are we saved from? Well, we're saved from these things. We're saved from this infection. We're saved from imperfection. We're saved from the life that's leading to death. And God does that. Well, how does God save us from this? How does he do that? Well, before we ask, answer that question, I wanna ask you a question that follows up with that. How would you do it? If it were left up to you, how would you save someone in a situation like this? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we would probably say, I wouldn't. Why would I save someone who's infected with sin and death? Why would I save someone who doesn't meet the standards that I set? Why would I save someone who rebels against me and hates me and does what they want all of their life? Why would I ever do that? Good question. How would you do it? See, what happens is we begin to understand why God saves us and how God saves us. We see the, just the vast difference between God, Christianity, and every other world religion. Let me boil every other world religion down for you. It's pretty simple. Are you ready? How do you save yourself? Or how does someone get saved? It's up to you. It's all on you. You have to work hard. You have to be smart. You have to give money. You have to do all of these things. You have to be sincere. You have to try hard. And then you have to hope on hope on hope that it's good enough. How does God save us? Well, in Romans 5.8, I want you to look at Romans 5.8 with me. but God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. One of the things that we need to see in the way that God saves us is that, that God's plan of salvation is a demonstration of his love. We must see that what God does for us to bring us back into relationship with him is first and foremost, his demonstration of love to us. Say, so, well, where do you get that from? Well, it's a demonstration of love because God doesn't wait for us to get our act together to save us. God isn't sitting in heaven with his arms crossed, looking with a frown on his face going, would you hurry up? I can't do anything until you do something. You gotta figure all this out on your own. And when you figure it all out, then I'll step in. No, did you hear what it said in the verse? God demonstrates his love for us while we are sinners. When we're at our worst, Jesus dies for us. It's an act of love because God doesn't hold our sin and rebellion against us. God has every right to say, you hated me. You didn't live for me. You didn't love me. You didn't worship me. And I'm not doing anything for you. I'm just gonna give you what you deserve but he doesn't do that. We will never truly understand God's love 
until we recognize that every one of us deserve to spend an eternity apart from God in hell for the things that we've done. But in God's love, he gives us a gift. It's a demonstration of his love. He demonstrates his love by patiently giving us time to repent and to turn to him. I was 18 years old before I came to faith in Jesus. And I think about so many times in my life where I was just a breath away from dying. I had so many accidents when I was a kid. It's like, I shouldn't be upright. I should not be walking, talking, functioning. And you probably can say the same thing. And sometimes we wonder why. Let me tell you why. The fact that you get up every morning and you have breath in your lungs and you have life to be able to live is because God has given you time to turn and to repent and come to him. It's an act of love. So if we know it's an act of love, how does God save us? Well, God freely offers forgiveness as a gift. I want you to go back and look at the end of Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Did you catch it? The free gift of God. How does God save us? Well, he offers us a gift. I like getting gifts. How about you? God has given us the greatest gift that can ever be received. And God's telling us that this is an act of love. It's an act of grace. It's an act of mercy that I'm giving you this gift. And and here's what we need to understand. There is nothing you can give him for the gift. See, we we, we mix this up all the time. I, I wanna try to illustrate it this way. Have you ever been at your birthday party and a friend gives you a birthday gift and you're like, wow, this is so wonderful. How much do I owe you? Can we put this on a payment plan? No, if that happens, it's no longer a gift, is it? See, what we need to understand is God has given us a gift. He's given us eternal life in Jesus Christ. He's given it to us. And here's what God is telling you. I don't accept payment for the gift. And I don't accept works for your sin. I don't know if you have this experience, but I do a lot. Uh, I'm out and about and I go in somewhere and I'm going to get some stuff and I miss the sign when I walk in, but then I walk up to the counter and they say cash only, no cards. I'm like, what are we in 1912? Why is this happening? But that's exactly what we do when we try to pay God for the gift that he's given us. God has a sign, sorry, we don't accept works for your salvation. It's an act of love, it's a free gift, but here's how God saves us. This is the most important part. God takes our place. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love for you that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. You need to sit with that for just a second. God didn't send an angel God didn't send a prophet. God didn't send a priest or a preacher. God himself 
took your place. There was a pastor that said one time, and I forget who it was, but he said, how terrible, how awful, how heinous must sin be if God himself has to die to set us free from it. You ever thought about that? How terrible must the predicament be that you're in that God had to come and die to set you free? We call this the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us about that. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Literally, here's what happens. We switch places. God himself was born as a man. He lived a sinless and perfect life. And when he went to the cross, here's what happened. God took Jesus, God himself, and switched places with us. Jesus stands condemned for all of my sin and all of my shame and all of my rebellion and all my doubt and all my fear and for yours as well. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for every person's sin who had lived, who is living and whoever will live. He took our place so that we could take his. If we accept the gift of God found only in Jesus, we switch places and God places all of our sin on Jesus so he can place all of his love and grace and mercy and freedom and forgiveness on us. Let me see if I can illustrate it better. You commit a crime, you get caught, you go to trial. Evidence is presented against you, overwhelming against you. The judge hears all of the case, all the evidence. And at the end of the case, he bangs his gavel and he says guilty on all charges. And the punishment is the death penalty. And as they're shackling you to take you away to die, the judge stands up and he unzips his judge robe and he says, stop, I'll pay the price for him. That's literally what happened when Jesus died for you. The judge declared you guilty and the judge took your place and he paid your debt and you are now free. That's how God saves us. So, what is required of us to be saved? How do we stop being lost? I want you to look at Romans 10. Romans 10 verses nine and 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Now, before we unpack this, there's a question that I wanna ask you. Do you wanna be rescued? Do you want to be rescued? And you may think, well, that's a weird question. Why, would, why wouldn't I want to be rescued? Well, there's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of people who love to live in the situation that they're in. I, I was that way for a long, long time. You may be here and you're actively doing things to keep yourself from being rescued. I sat in the church for 18 years 
heard the gospel a million times and I rejected it every time. And you know how I did it most times? I just didn't pay attention. We like to pretend that if we don't actively say no, that we're neutral. No, every time that you hear the gospel and you don't respond, you're saying no to God. Do you want to be rescued? Because if you do, here's how it happens. He talked about believing and confessing. Now, we use the word believe all the time and I don't think we understand what it means. There's a biblical belief that God brings to us and here's that biblical belief is what it means that you are persuaded you are persuaded by something so much that you're willing to hang your eternity on it. I believe. See, there's a difference between believing about something and believing in something. If I had a chair up here, I would show you this illustration, but I think I can walk you through it and you understand it. How do you believe in a chair? How do you believe in it? You sit down. Most of the time, we don't even check it. We just sit down. We say, I trust it. And so because I trust this chair, I'm sitting down. Now that's believing in. Let me tell you how you can believe about a chair. I'll just pick one of the chairs here in the sanctuary. Here's believing about a chair. Well, this chair looks about the right height of a regular chair. It has metal legs that I think would hold me if I sat down in them. The cushion on it looks really comfortable. I think I would be comfortable if I sat down in that chair and it's a, a dark colored chair, maybe a brownish black and there's a, some little yellow spots in there. I can give you all the dimensions of the chair. That's not believing in the chair. Just because I can describe it and I can tell you all about it doesn't mean I've trusted it. Are you believing about? Or are you believing in? And Jesus says that you have to believe in him. Listen, it's not enough if you can recite these verses to me and tell me everything about the gospel that's believing about. Have you trusted in Jesus? Placing your faith in Jesus means this. If Jesus, Jesus, if you can't get me to heaven, I'm not going. Because I trust nothing else. I don't trust church membership. I don't trust baptism. I don't trust Sunday school. I don't trust anything except you. You believe. The heart believes in Jesus. And when the heart believes in Jesus, then there's a confession that comes. Now, this is a twofold confession, two types of confession. There's a confession of guilt and a confession of hope. That first one is what gets people. I am a sinner. And I deserve wrath and justice and punishment and hell. God, I am a sinner. But then there is a confession of hope. But I believe that Jesus saved me from my sin and I'm trusting Jesus today. Jesus, save me from my sin. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And what does it say? You will be saved. You'll be rescued. So here's a question. What prevents you from being rescued today? For many of us, what prevents us from being rescued is our pride. I sat for a lot of years in services and I heard the gospel and my pride would not let me get out of my seat. What are people gonna think? What are people gonna say? They're gonna think that I'm a sinner who needs Jesus. How terrible is that for people to know? Here's a little secret. Do you know how you become a member of the church? You have to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. 
every person sitting in here today that believes in Jesus, that loves Jesus, has had to make the same step that I'm asking you today where we have to say, I am a sinner. And I need help. But you know, more than that, there may be some today that are saying, why did you spend an entire service on the gospel? We've heard it. We know it. Do you? The gospel is something that we should hear all the time, and we should rejoice over it when we hear it. Nothing makes me happier than to be reminded of the fact that I love and serve a God who demonstrated his love for me, that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me and gave me freedom and forgiveness. I rejoice in that. But you need to be reminded. When we hear the gospel, you need to be reminded that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. You can always stop and turn around and Jesus will love you and Jesus will heal you and Jesus will forgive you and set you free. You need to be reminded that God is the kind of God to give grace and mercy and freedom and forgiveness if you ask. So here's the question. What keeps you from being rescued today? I know that there are people who are hearing this today who've never asked Jesus to save them. You've convinced yourself you're a good person. You've convinced yourself you're gonna do enough to offset the bad stuff that you've done. But here's the reality, nobody can save you but Jesus. Why would you wait one more second and not respond to him? And there's tons of us who've done that, but have allowed stuff to creep into our life, have allowed ourselves to be overwhelmed by habits and lifestyles and sin in our life. And here's the thing, you can find freedom today. The gospel's for you too. What keeps you from being rescued? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear of the wonderful message of the gift that you've given us in Jesus. And God, I pray today that we, that we would take this opportunity to receive your gift and be set free. Father, help us to say yes to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.